Hey everybody, welcome back to Diesel Creek. My name's Matt, behind me, this beautiful hunk of iron here is a Bucyrus Erie 22B, a 1950 model, set up with a shovel. So if you haven't seen the previous videos on this machine, I'll leave a link down in the description. You're gonna to wanna to check that out. I bought this thing at an auction and it had been sitting in the same spot since 1999, yet we were able to get this thing fired up and walk it right up onto a low boy trailer and brought it here. So in the previous videos on this machine, I kind of went on about how good a shape it was in and uh, a few people in the comments took issue with that and informed me that it was not in good shape and it was actually a pile of scrap metal that I should have walked away from. While I disagree with you wholeheartedly, hopefully in today's video, I can maybe prove you wrong about that. This particular machine is actually in very good shape considering the age. And unfortunately, I was told that it was in even better shape when it got parked where it was in 1999. So the man's estate that I got it from, I was told that he bought it from an auction where it had sat inside pretty much its whole life and it really kind of looks like I could believe that because the only rot that I can see at all, I mean of course this is rusty here but that's just patina, that's beautiful. And the only rot that I can find whatsoever on this machine is right up there in that corner and it is not bad at all. All the doors are straight and function. There's no rust at the bottoms of them, no rot at all. The engine runs pretty good. We are gonna service that in this video as well and hopefully get some new cables strung on this thing so we can get it back in the dirt. The first thing we need to do is clean this thing up so we can actually work on it though. Cab or the house as it's referred to on a machine like this, which is the entire top part of the machine above the tracks, the part that rotates. The house is full of all kinds of garbage and leftover stuff from decades of use and neglect. So we're gonna start by cleaning all that out. So we're gonna start by cleaning all that out in here, getting all the garbage out, and then we're gonna fire up the old steam jenny and give this thing a good bath. And I'm really hoping that the paint cleans up pretty good on here because eventually I would like to restore this machine, but I think it's pretty far down the list because it doesn't need it near as bad as some of the other machines I have, like the Pork 212 motor grader sitting over there. That was bought from the same auction, and if you haven't seen those videos, you should definitely check those ones out as well. I did just barely nip this thing with the pressure washer a few weeks back, and that's what the paint looks like underneath this stuff, so I got pretty high hopes here. I really think this thing is gonna clean up pretty nice. But anyways, let's get to it. So there is all kinds of trash and garbage from us reviving this machine, plus stuff that's been in here for clearly decades. It actually kind of smells like dead animals in here, like dead mice or birds or something. It's not a good stink. Well, I don't know what that is, but it's garbage. Oh yeah, 20 year old Bush light cans in here. Bud light can with a date of 2006 and a mountain of a mouse dominium in here. That whole big pile of mouse dominium there, that's gotta go. I don't know whether a cat got a hold of a bird in here or, or what, but I mean, the feathers, it just looks like the bird went poof. This is the stinkiest machine I think I've bought. Really foul. Must be a whole case of Bud Light in here. Oh yeah. Yeah, there's the skull of a rodent. Not, not sure what. Ugh. Man, this is foul. The rodents really loved it in here, apparently. We're just getting started and I already can't wait to get a shower. Maybe it was raccoons in here. It kind of has that raccoon smell to it. And all this gunk over here that's melted onto the floor must be the gelatinous remains of that raccoon skull that we found. I'm seeing plenty of raccoon fur stuck to greasy parts to make me think that that's 
what happened in here. We got the back of the machine cleaned out fairly decently. Still some more junk up here in the in the cab, including the skeletal remains of another critter. So we're gonna try to sweep that all out the back. Found another pile of bones underneath all the draw works. Well, we got the bulk of everything cleared out in here. Apparently I forgot to press record, but I just backed it up a little bit and turned it. Put the boom all the way down so we can uh, get a good scrub going here. Let's get the pressure washer fired up.
We got this thing all cleaned up. It is time to do a little service action on this thing. It's got, Lord only knows how old the oil is in this thing, and that goes for the filters as well. We did pull out the fuel filters whenever we revived this thing in the field, and the way Caterpillar makes the filters for these things, I think I have some here somewhere. This right here is actually what the fuel filters look like for this machine, so they're kind of just like, they almost look like a roll of gauze. And if they're dirty at all, you can see it very easily. So we did pull these out and check them in the field, and they looked really good. So we're not going to bother to change those yet because Caterpillar is pretty proud of these things. They're like $38 a piece, and I think this machine has six of them in there. And if they start to get clogged up, A, it's not going to hurt anything. You just got to change them. And B, I got a fuel pressure gauge in there, and if the pressure starts to drop, that's a good indication your filters are getting clogged. So... No sense in throwing money at it that uh, we don't need to. I have heard some horror stories about these old paper filters though. If they sit for a long time, they might degrade and when you fire it up, it sucks that paper through the system and clogs up all your oil ports and causes uh, basically overpressurizing of the oil system. So we're gonna get those switched out today. We're gonna put some fresh oil in it and top off the uh, oil bath air cleaners. Then once we get some cable on it, it's gonna be ready to hit the dirt. Long time viewers to the channel will recall this oil catch pan that I got from Fluid all a year or two back. And man, since I have a concrete floor to actually run this thing on now, oh, this is the greatest oil pan ever. All right, it looks like somebody made this pretty easy for us here. This looks like a quarter turn valve. And if I can get it to turn, we should be able to just drain the oil right out. Ah, it is stiff, I'll tell you that. Oh yeah. We got oil draining though. Oil really doesn't look too bad, all things considered. Up top here, we can drain out the filter housing now. Hot jambalaya. Yep, that's warm. Now theoretically, if you drain your filter housing, changing out these cartridges shouldn't be a mess, but sometimes it is anyways. There you go. There's your paper element. I have never, never had an oil filter fight me this bad. This is ridiculous. This brass deal is like a pre-screen here. As you can see, there is some junk on it, and it's got a bit of sludge down on the inside there. We'll have to wash that out before we put it back in. Like everything, way more of a struggle than it should have been. Had to stop down at Napa this morning and get some oil for today's project. I do use my air ones. It's about 90. All right. Well, we're back from our Napa run here. I've got some new Napa Golds for this thing, and, and of course, nothing but the best dinosaurs for this thing. We've got Rotella T5 here. This is the semi-synthetic blend. So I think that the semi-synthetic blend really gets you a nice mix of properties. So you get the benefits from the conventional and the benefits from the synthetic. I like the T5 for the money. 
it uh, seems like the best of both worlds. Got our pre-filters cleaned up as best I could. That is something you definitely don't see anymore. But these ones don't fit. Well, it's always something, isn't it? So I did some Googling around before I ordered filters. And the filters that I ordered, it said would fit in this D318. I don't doubt that it does fit in some D318s, but not this one. I'm gonna guess that this is an earlier housing that takes these things. The filters that I have will not just go in place of this either. It doesn't have the correct bottom flange to accept the filter. So we're gonna be stuck using these, which I'm not upset about, but I am upset that I don't have the proper filters right now. I thought some of you guys would appreciate this though. Look at that old filter. Caterpillar quit using that font, I think in the late 60s. Maybe, maybe, maybe this was still laying around in the 70s, but uh, that filter has been in there for a long time. That is a part number 1S9150. All right, it's the next day. We got the proper filters. Let's put this thing back together. That simple. All right. As I said before, time to give her the good stuff. You gotta love a machine too that has a proper place to pour your oil in at. Nice big filler neck, no funnel required. That's the best. I did shut the filler valve off, right? You ever do that? You start dumping oil back in something and then forget you didn't put the plug in or in this case shut the valve off? Bad time. I'm not sure how many of these jugs this thing's gonna take. I don't know the capacity, actually. Well, this is gallon four. If I was a betting man, I'd say it probably holds around five. We're still below full on the stick, but these old cats, you have to read while the engine's running. When the engine's not running, they usually read way over full. Plus, we still got to fill up our oil filters, so that'll suck down some oil as well. So we can't be neglecting our poor pony motor here either. I drained the oil out of it while you guys weren't looking. Let's fill it up with the good stuff as well. Might need a funnel for this one. Barely spilled a drop. Right on the money. All right, I got you guys set up here. I'm gonna start up the pony engine and crank over the big engine until we build up oil pressure. So that's this top gauge here. You guys just holler whenever we get into the green oil pressure. Looked like the oil pressure came up pretty quick. I don't see any leaks back here around our filter canisters, so that's good. I couldn't remember if we had this gap here before I changed the filters or not, but they're not leaking, so it must have been there before. All right, we should be good to go here.
All right, I just checked the dipstick while we're running here and we are right on the money, so that's good. We are currently five and a half jugs deep into this oil change and we still have to change the oil for the oil bath air cleaners on the Pony and the diesel. So that's all we've got left to do on this service though, so we're coming down the home stretch. Doesn't look too dirty. Oh, I stand corrected. Yeah. This one's for the pony engine. I cleaned it out really good, filled it up with oil. All right, this old girl's ready to go. Are you excited? Yeah, I'm excited. Cause the day hath finally come. I've got a couple spools of new wire rope here. And we are gonna get the old 22B strung up with some fresh new cables. So the reason the bucket is chained up like that to the boom is because the hoist cable was broken when I bought the machine, as well as the trip cable, which is the small one up the side here and all that. Pop the latch for the bucket and the crowd cable is still intact but definitely seen better days it's got a bunch of uh, broken strands on it and the top line there that's your boom cable that one is also pretty darn rusted and I really don't trust it at all so we're gonna work from the top down I'm gonna lower the boom all the way to the ground we're gonna restring the boom cable first that's some 5 8 6 by 25 I think and once that's done we will move on to probably the hoist and then the crowd last, well, trip, I guess, would technically be last, but the trip is very minor. Alrighty. With the boom safely down on the ground, we are ready to start taking the old rope off and putting the new rope on. Alright, so I know some people get a little overwhelmed by some of this cable routing. It kind of looks confusing at a glance, but really nothing to it. Basically, where the cable is terminated right here, that's called a becket. And there is actually a wedge inside of here. And we'll drive the wedge, well first of all we'll, rem we'll remove it from that pin right there, get it down on the ground where we can work on it. Then there's a wedge in there that just wedges the cable into the becket. We'll drive the, we'll drive the wedge out and then we will uh, remove the cable from it. Basically after we have the end of the cable free though, we'll just pull it back the opposite direction of travel until we get all the way back over here to where the cable drops down into the house and wraps up onto the drum. Well, in the interest of saving time and effort, rather than trying to manhandle this whole cable and uh, wiggle that pin out up there at the becket, I'm just gonna go ahead and cut the cable here and then we can uh, take the becket off a lot easier. Obviously, this cable doesn't have any tension on it. You're definitely gonna wanna make sure before you ever cut a cable that there's no tension on it. So I'm still learning about wire rope. I, I definitely don't know that much about it, but I know that there's different types of wired rope. There's uh, independent wire core rope, which basically the whole cable is made out of wire. Or there's stuff like this that is a fiber core 
Uh, in the original manufacturer spec, the cable calls for a hemp core wire rope. Um, they don't use that to my knowledge today, but they have modern synthetic equivalents. Basically, it just has to do with uh, how the cable wraps on the drum. If there's a chance that the cable is going to be layered and you're going to crush the cable, they want the wire core. Otherwise, you can use the hemp center from my understanding. All right. That wasn't too bad, all things considered. There's the Beckett. As you can see, the cable just comes up through, folds over itself, comes back down, and it traps that wedge in there, and it pulls it down into this triangle shape so it wedges itself in there and can't pull through. Now you can see why I cut the cable, too, because we're only fighting six foot of rope rather than the weight of the entire assembly here. Okay, I cut the tail off of the becket now so we can get to the wedge easier in the center there. So we're going to get a drift and a big hammer and start driving this thing. Hopefully the way I have it just kind of sitting in the track here will be enough to hold it while I hit it. Look at that. Right out. Ha <laughs> ha. Like to see that. Alright, so there's your wedge. If you can tell, it's got like a dish on the inside so that the cable lays in it real nice. Here's our old rope. Stick that back in there for safekeeping until we're ready to reinstall the new stuff. Alright, now rather than trying to pull all that cable by hand, let's uh, implore some mechanical help. Well, I guess the whole tractor idea may have been a bit excessive. The drum is already empty. I thought there was a bit more rope on that drum than there was. Push the wire through by hand. All right, well, I kind of, I didn't screw up, but I did this 
a harder way than I should have. I was thinking that this spool had enough to do the boom and the hoist rope and I just checked my measurements again and my order and I'm thinking now that this spool is 120 feet and that's what we need exactly for the boom. So I shouldn't have to cut anything off of this spool. There's a separate piece over there that's going to do the hoist. It's a different uh, cable makeup and that's why they're separate. But had I realized that I wasn't going to have to cut anything off of the spool instead of dragging it out down the driveway and getting it all dirty at the same time, I would have just started feeding it up into the machine and uh, we wouldn't have had to work as hard. But here I am struggling as always. Before we climb up there and put ourselves in a bad spot trying to set a becket, it's just easier to do it on the ground here. There we go, that's pretty much all there is to it. You guys can really start speaking up when you see a guy doing something wrong. I started kind of looking at the way the cable would pull here pretty funny and decided to look it up and good thing I did. I put the cable in backwards. All right, that's a little more what it should look like right there. back in the house here I just fed the I just fed the rope down through the uh, basically an internal becket in the in the drum here I'm trying to pass the dead end back through right now That actually looks pretty well set. I think we should be ready to try to fire this thing up and pick the boom up. I had to lift the boom up a little bit to be able to get the house door open to pull the cable for the hoist. Um, but in this position right here looks to be a fairly achievable way of getting the new cable pulled through. All right, being as that the hoist rope is broken, that's this guy here, we need to pull what's left of the rope off the drum there. With that brake released, we should be able to just pull that right out of there. Oh yeah, just, just pull it right out of here. It'll be so easy.
There we go. Oh, nothing, nothing to it. It's, it's so easy. Can't believe everybody doesn't have one of these things. Same thing as before. We just got to pound out that wedge in there. Look at that. Didn't even take much to pop that one loose. That's good. We got to change the crowd cable yet so buddy sam from scrappy industries as you guys well know is the 22b master i'm told so we're here to string up a crowd cable this looks confusing i'm in over my head help all right we got the boom sitting on the ground here and there is an adjusting bolt here that sam is currently loosening up Trying to. it's got about 45 miles of thread on it and 70 years worth of grease but the cable that runs the crowd here is actually two separate cables, Sam just informed me. I thought it was one that was pulling off some sort of magic trick in there. Uh, it winds up on the bottom of the boom. These are two separate cables on top here, and then there's another one that runs back up the boom too. And I'm still not positive how this all works. As you can see, the cable running up the stick here is doubled up and gets to the end of the stick and turns around and comes right back down confusing so it's the outside of 
that little drum at the bottom right now and the retract cable is this one on the inside so as you crowd out the retract cable is going off the drum and then this one can take up that that lagging space basically right but they are two different cables with that's the only way to tension the whole deal is that eye bolt we're trying to loosen and if you let that get loose and the cable gets in the chain then you can have the fun i had a couple years ago on mine which is not fun at all did it get like wound into the sprockets oh, and everything yeah it was bad it was bad was there torches involved <laughs> Sam cheated here. Took the cable clamps <laughs> off that uh, thimble end there, and now we should be able to get that. Oh yeah, look at that, it slides right out. I didn't realize that either. I thought you had to unscrew the whole nut. Now you can wire wheel that real nice for us. I can do that on that big big uh, wire wheel I got in the shop. Oh, no, it looks it's like it's moving. There, there you go. Hitting now. No, it's coming. Keep going. I think mean, the cable just came right out of there. It wasn't even like an hour ago that we started that process. And, you know, it's really, as soon as Sam showed up, everything was just so much easier, you know? I had so much problem with the wedges that I did by myself. And when Sam was here, they weren't a problem at all. Not fell out put in yesterday oh, that sucked Matt what are we doing trying to match the new cable to the old cable size which Sam tells me should be fairly critical on account of the way this works it has to be pretty close so fingers crossed it's right this is the crowd out cable which goes over the end of the stick it basically doubles over that kink is the middle that kink is in the middle of the cable is at the end of the stick. And then each side goes back over the shipper shaft there at the pivot point and back to each side of the drum. And then we get this one hooked up first and basically tension it up with the machine. And then the retract cable is just a single part that goes from the bucket end of the stick over the top of the shipper shaft back down to the drum. And it has that turnbuckle on the end we took off. That's what tensions the cables. And you have to keep the cables tight, like we said before, so they don't get wrapped up on the bottom of the drum. But because you only have that much leeway, it basically comes down to pulling the cable in tight through this eye and hooking it with the cable clamps with that thing all the way loose. Because wherever you clamp it, that's the starting of your tensioning point and then making up for cable wear going forward. Well, it's almost dark, but we finally managed to get all the cables installed there. It was a battle, but we won.
We are so close to sinking this bucket back in the dirt for the first time in ages and ages, but we have one more cable to replace. That's the trip cable. The trip cable runs from inside the house there, underneath the house, up the boom to that shiv and down to the bucket. And what that trip cable does is release the trap door on the bucket here. So it trips, it trips the latch and it's supposed to yank up on this lever here, which in turn lifts this chain, which undoes the latch there. Problem is, well, A, the cable's broken, but B, this, uh, this bell crank here, I think you'd call this, this thing here is supposed to, you know, freely move and she don't move. Everything is really rusted in there. I don't know how well you can see that. So we got to get that thing freed up and moving. I'm going to go ahead and bust out the torch and start heating things up because there's no way that we're moving that without a torch. Success. Wow, I'm surprised at how quick that's going back into almost floating, which is basically what this is supposed to do. Yeah, look at that, it's already spring them a thing and back. Wow. That's impressive. Usually you free up something like this, you gotta work it back and forth a hundred times before it'll ever start kind of returning on its own. All right, so I got the boom down so that I could easily replace the trip cable here. And I was gonna replace it, but, but I'm thinking about just leaving the original one on here for now. It really doesn't look that bad and it doesn't perform any crucial work. It's also easy to replace in the field. I can put the new cable, hang it in the machine, and if I ever break it, I'll have it. It looks like just the loop down here where it would have been sitting in the water in the bucket. The way the machine was sitting when I got it, this bucket would have been, this area here where the trip cable connects would have always been in a puddle. And I think that's why that cable rotted out as it was sitting submerged in water all the time. So basically I'm just gonna cut like a foot of it off here and make another loop and reconnect it where we need to. The function of the trip cable is a little different than the other lines on the machine. The other lines on the machine will just sit static unless you apply the clutch. Uh, this one here kind of always has a little bit of friction engaged on it. It'll always kind of retract itself and keep itself snug. Not tight, but snug. So as you can see, I can easily pull it out by hand. But see, just like a seat belt, it's kind of sucking itself back in there. If that way you don't have extra line hanging out there. So that's gonna be super easy. I'm just going to hack the end of that off and we're going to put another loop on that trip. Going to give her a try here. <laughs> it works. All right. If my calculations are correct, we are finally ready to go sink this thing into the dirt. I'm excited. I've only spent a very small amount of time on a shovel before actually digging and working it so I got a lot to learn I definitely don't know what I'm doing by any stretch of the imagination so don't judge me too harshly you're about to see my first attempts there's a pile of dirt over here calling my name I'm gonna give it a couple scoops first and then I'm gonna pull the dump truck up there and see if I can't throw a, a load on the dump truck as my uh, my first go at it
<laughs> Back in action, baby. It digs dirt. It finally digs dirt. As I mentioned, I have no idea what I'm doing. So there's people that could hop on this thing and uh, make it dance. And uh, Buddy Sam being one of them. But I'm still learning the ropes. Literally learning the ropes there. You got to be careful you don't make them jump off. I'm also missing a couple of the guards that help keep the ropes from jumping off the shivs. So those will be something we have to make or find in the future. But it, it does take a scoop of dirt. This setup is not ideal. Uh, shovels are designed for cut work, like so working against a cut bank. They're not really good at uh, picking up small piles of dirt like this. So this is kind of just me playing around. I, I even even somebody that's really good would probably struggle to really fill up the bucket really well with this hillside because what you're doing is you're wind up just pushing the whole pile away from you. But nonetheless, this pile does need to be removed, so I'm going to fire up the dump truck and bring it over here and see if I can't throw a few scoops in the bed at least before we call this thing a wrap. Well, I am impressed. The old girl is a handful, but she seems to be just chugging right along. I did stall it out there. I was only running it like half throttle because full throttle seemed to be uh, a bit ambitious for somebody of my skill level. So when I finally managed to get a full bucket there on the last scoop, it didn't like that kind. It stalled her out, but uh, that's okay. I need to shut it down and go to the house anyway so that I can edit this video to you guys. I don't know if you could tell on the time lapse there, but I did make one boo-boo. I uh, accidentally let my foot off the hoist brake while I was coming around there. And the poor old dump truck took a hit. That was not bent like that before. Pretty, pretty bummed out about that, but you know, dump trucks take a beating, it's what they do. She'll be okay. We did manage to load all that dirt though, so. Once I get the hang of this thing, we'll just be taking this thing out on jobs, you know? Just, just a regular old production machine, I guess. In the same scoop of dirt, when I whapped the tailgate, of course the bucket opened up and dropped dirt all over my nice milling topped driveway too. So, gonna have to broom that off to the side. Not too shabby though overall, guys. I'm really happy with it. It's running great. The longer I run it, the better it seems to run as well. I think I have the boom angled a little bit steep for the digging I'm doing here. Should probably drop that down some, but like I said, I'm learning. I need to grease up the stick really badly. Uh, that's definitely on the list. I, everything, I mean, I've greased this whole machine a couple times already, but it's gonna get one super good thorough greasing here before we uh, really sick it on a project. And I do have a project in mind. And then of course after that's done it's going to go up to the national pike steam show where i can uh, enjoy it and you guys can come see it in action as well so looking forward to that
Well guys, I guess that about wraps this one up. I'd like to thank you guys for hanging out with me as always. You know, it's funny, every time I get one of these old machines up and running again, I always get a bunch of comments on the video, people saying things like, wow, Matt, you must be so smart to be able to fix all this stuff. Or, wow, Matt, you have a wealth of knowledge to be able to work on all this old gear. I always think that those comments are pretty funny because if you would have known me 10 or 15 years ago when I was in high school, my grades told a very different story. As I've gotten older, I realized that I actually love to learn. I just don't like to do it in the traditional classroom with a textbook kind of way. So as I've gotten older here, I've found that I actually like to educate myself on all sorts of different topics. And the most effective way I've found to do that lately is also today's video sponsor, Brilliant. As a visual learner myself, Brilliant helps me absorb the knowledge with thousands of fun and interactive lessons from the very basics to the most advanced levels. No matter your skill, Brilliant customizes content to fit your needs and allows you to solve lessons at your own pace. Brilliant is the most effective way to learn math, data, and computer science interactively. And if you are interested in trying it out for yourself, you can head on over to brilliant.org slash dieselcreek where you'll get 30 days for free and 20% off an annual plan. That's brilliant.org slash dieselcreek. I myself have a lot of fun with the problem solving lessons, specifically the ones found in the logic course. They got a lot of fun puzzles and thought experiments that uh, can help keep the old ticker sharp. Basically what I do here every day is problem solving. So I wanna give a big, big thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring today's episode. Without good sponsors like that, a lot of this stuff would not be possible and it most certainly would not be possible without viewers like you guys. So even bigger thanks to you guys for watching and following along. But that's all I have for today. So if you guys like the video, do me a big favor. As always, hit that thumbs up button down below. And if you're not already, be sure you're tickling that subscribe button so I can see you on the next video. Thanks for watching. Later. Mm -hmm.